Welcome everyone. My name is Akasemi Newsom, and I'm the Associate Director of the Institute of European Studies here at the University of California at Berkeley. We are honored today to have a lecture by Professor Sidana Nithani from Uwawar Nehru University in India. The title of her lecture will be Decolonizing German Cultural Anthropology, Narrative of Time and Space in Contemporary German Villages. Before we start with her lecture, a bit about our speaker. So Professor Sidana Nithani is Professor of German Literature and Cultural Anthropology at the Center of German Studies at Jawaharlal Nehru University in Delhi. She is also the coordinator of the folklore program at the same institution. She is president of the International Society for Folk Narrative Research and fellow at the American Folklore Society. Currently, she's a Fulbright visiting professor teaching at the Department of Anthropology and Folklore here at the University of California, Berkeley, where she is also researching narratives about wildlife created under context of colonialism, conservation movements, and scientific discoveries. Professor Nathani's interdisciplinary work has traversed international folklore and folkloristics. She studied the history of folkloristics since the 19th century in Europe, India, and the United States in the context of nationalism, colonialism, socialism, and post-colonial paradigms challenging Eurocentrism in folkloristics in the study of folklore collections compiled by British colonial rulers, she brought forth the role of native scholars in making these works. Her study of German villages also challenges another form of Eurocentrism, the absence of ethnographic studies of European society by scholars of color. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Nisbet. Thank you, Professor Akasimi Newsom, um, for this kind introduction and for the invitation to deliver this talk at the Institute of Europe European Studies. I'm indeed very honored to be here and to be presenting uh, this paper of mine called Decolonizing German Cultural Anthropology, Narratives of Time and Space in Contemporary German Villages. Recently, I happened to see the recording of a talk held at IES some time ago by historian Glenn Penny of UCLA. In fact, I've just been told that he is also online today. And so, hello, Professor Penny. Um, I didn't know that you are going to be there. I just enjoyed your talk very much. And so, where he was talking about the global aspects of Germany's modern history. It was an excellent talk and became particularly interesting for me as the speaker started drawing on the works of German cultural anthropologist, Hermann Bausinger. He came across Bausinger's work in the course of his research and was amazed at the advanced level of theoretical propositions made by Bausinger in 1960s. He correctly pointed out that much of Bausinger's work has remained relatively unknown to the English-speaking world. Within Germany and to cultural anthropologists worldwide, however, Hermann Bausinger has been very well known. Bausinger's ideas transformed the discipline of cultural anthropology within Germany in 1960s. The intellectual transformation post-World War II has been the subject of my book, Folklore Theory, in post-war Germany published in 2014. To put it very briefly, the issue was that before the, 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 before the war, the discipline was called Volkskunde, the Volkskunde, and was rooted in philology, though understood as cultural anthropology of Europe. The discipline and its major concepts were used so widely by the Nazi regime that after the war, the discipline stood tainted. There was a huge debate among scholars regarding the future of the discipline after the war. The, the debate cannot be summarized here, but Bausinger proposed in 1960s that the discipline should be seen 
as a social science and called it cultural anthropology. Over the decades, Bausinger's idea was widely accepted and today all departments of Volkskunde are called Kultur Anthropologie, Cultural Anthropology, or Europäische Ethnology, European Ethnology. The struggle of the German scholars was with their country's national and disciplinary history. At a time when cultural anthropology in the English speaking world was engaging in the critique of anthropology's colonial past and exploring anti colonial and decolonial perspectives. Now, what does that have to do with me? I do German studies in German, and the radical transformation of Volkskunde is sufficient for my research or was until I decided in 2013 to study contemporary German villages. I realized that as an Indian scholar of German cultural anthropology, I had neither intellectual history nor popular history in that country. Intellectually, no Indian or Asian, and actually even African or Latin American, has done cultural anthropological study of Germany. As I checked, I realized that in spite of decades of post-colonial theory, the post-colonial colonials of the colonized of the uh, of the erstwhile colonized world do not write ethnographies of European societies. The reverse is, of course, the norm. In some ways, this applies to cultural anthropology outside Germany also. I was therefore left to initiate a decolonizing paradigm of studying a European society as a non-European scholar. This one, research on German villages, was a field work based research. And on the field, notions about non-European world, India specifically, remained split into two strains. One, dominated by 19th century perceptions, and two, by media, especially news networks. So when I started the fieldwork based research, I did not have intellectual models to follow or refute, just my own awareness of myself as a post-colonial scholar of German culture. The subjects of my research, the village residents, could not place me anywhere in their concept of the world. They were surprised at an educated German-speaking Indian woman academic, for so they only knew either the widow burning custom of India that was outlawed in 1850s or the female rape victims of recent times. Intellectually and on the field, there was no reference that could explain my presence uh, and I, uh, my presence. And I understood then that in a way, even the radical ideas of 1960s remained provincial for they failed to include the internationally influential works of German anthropologists conducted across the colonial world, whether the colonies were German or not. On colonialism, Germany's stance has been that they were not a big colonial power, so post-colonialism is irrelevant. This is so untrue because German scholars, especially philologists, and natural scientists were all over the world, very often sponsored by German kings and bringing back materials and knowledge back to Germany. This context, intellectual and popular, defined the progression of my research in many ways, but ultimately in unprecedented ways. As I identified my field of study uh, in consultation with ethnologist Professor Mikhail Penske, a group of 16 villages in the municipality of Gleichen in Lower Saxony, Germany, not far from the university town of Göttingen, became the places I went to again and again. And had pandemic not caused the break, I would have been there in the last two years too. Warned by my German friends about the reserved nature of Germans, I started making my forays. My first round of research were instances where people had had more questions about me than I had about them. And I could not have proceeded without actually introducing them, not only to me, but the fact that there are millions of women like me in India, not speaking German, of course, but similar in many other ways. That I was not a privileged Indian American. That's 
the best, closest they can taste me. Uh, all resident of UK, but an ordinary Indian born much after independence and learned both English and German in India. Big surprise. Several people made it a point to tell me that they did not approve of the terrible situation of Indian women. Instinctively, they placed themselves in a position of enlightening me, a rather colonial enterprise. <laughs> Ironically, it also made them drop their defenses and open up to me. I was interested in understanding the temporality and speciality of culture through narratives the narratives that I call narratives of time and space. All residents I researched uh, with live in villages. Three out of the four have lived there since the 1940s and one has lived there in 1980s. While three narrators form a group that experienced the post-war and the changes in the village life since then, one narrator represents the generation that has no direct relationship with the post-war, but was interested in the village life. Since all the narrators narrated their lives over hours, I retell it here based on the record of their narrative. I retell it in my words and in fragments of theirs, which I include as video clips here. In retelling these narratives, the questions that I am asking are, one, whether folk narrative plays a role in the narration of personal life. Two, how people remember the post-war moment. Three, where do they see the change? It is well known that the nature of village changed with the advent of industrialization, but the World War II tore the village community asunder. The concept village is full of connotations of agriculture, community life, and cohesion. In any view from afar, a German village still has is dominated by agricultural fields and rather small number of houses. As a scholar of German folklore, I was aware of the pre-war and the pre-industrial depiction of the village in narratives and songs. I wanted to find out how today's residents define their space with reference to time. And that point in time for my research was 1945. Studies tell us that World War II had destroyed some facts connected with the term village, stable community of people who have ancestral connections to the space, a shared dialect, relationship to land and church. These are features destroyed by the World War II. In terms of infrastructure too, rural and urban spaces are not very different. But the village as a concept and an entity survives in Germany. And I was looking for its contemporary meaning to narratives of time and space. I have uh, selected four narratives out of the many naturally for today's presentation. And um, I have titled these four narratives that I discussed today. The first one is The Last Farmer of Rheinhausen. Number two, the ex-soldier at 92. Number three, the makers and keepers of Bremke Forest Theatre. And number four, the woman who made a commune. So let's start with the first narrative. The last farmer of Rheinhausen. This is the story of 85 years old Günther Zilke, resident of village Rheinhausen. I met him at his home and recorded his narrative in May 2013. Quotes, I'm a man from the day before yesterday, said 85 years old Gunther Silke, and once again his eyes welled up with tears. Oh, my head, my head, said he, knocking on his temples and forehead while telling the story of his life. After, um, sorry, yeah. After the war, at age 20, he was in Aachen on the western border of Germany. And he tells his family's story, which we will briefly hear in his words. Maria Magdalene, 103 years old. 
die Familie Ziegel geliebte bis 17 oder 10 in, in Pommern, bis 1901 in der Ukraine und bis 45 in Westpreußen. That's the story of that uh, family's German family movement, farmers. So Zilke had no family left at the end of the World War II and was staying in a room when he saw an uh, advertisement, Farmer Required. A family in Rheinhausen village was looking for a trained farmer to take care of their farms. Upon arrival in Rheinhausen in early 1950s, he realized that the family consisted of a mother and a 16-year-old daughter. Male members had all died in the war. He started farming for them. After two years, he married the daughter and became part of the family. Some years later, in 1950s, mechanization of agriculture started in a major way, making agriculture expensive to practice, but also very profitable. So small farmers started selling out their farms. Silke started buying farms and machinery. Finally, there were only two farmers left, both with huge amounts of land, um, while the other farmer later sold land for village development and slowly gave up farming, Silke continued to leave, lead a thriving agricultural business. One of his two daughters now has studied agriculture in the university and manages the farms, but the actual farming now is done by corporate companies. His wife has now passed away. Silke lives in the same house to which he came from Aachen. He is sad that today's generation does not work with their hands. Let us hear in his own words. Keiner will arbeiten. Alle nur hier. Viel Geld, Auto und Urlaub und schicke Weiber. Ja, das ist Scheiße. Naja. Und ich bin einer von vorgestern, ne? Hm. Nicht sehen Sie, sehen Sie, ne? Yeah. Als ich geboren wurde, hat der Professor gesagt, Sie sind mein, das wird mein gutmütiger Mensch. <lacht> Großen Dank. And he cries. So let's go to the second narrative. Um, the second story is called The Ex-Soldier at 92. This is the study of, uh, story of 92 years old Ernst Knauf. I met him at the village Christmas celebration on December 18, 2014, when my first film on Rheinhausen was screened at the village Christmas festival. After seeing the film, he urged me to come to him and said, I have a story to tell. He invited me to his house on December 23, 2014 afternoon. His living room had Christmas decoration and coffee and cake on the table. Pale at 92, he poured coffee for me, but before I could touch it, he started telling his story. The sense of urgency was palpable, and I was ready to record, only to be stunned and silently face a dilemma. His story started 70 years ago, on the Christmas Eve of 1942. The juxtaposition of the Christmas Eve, of the moment in which we were, 2014, the decorated room, and that of 70 years ago was unsettling, to say the least. Here is that bit in his own words, the start of his story. I was by the Panzern, Sturm geschützt, and my Erfolg was 59 Russische Panzer abgeschossen zu haben. Ich bin dreimal selber abgeschossen worden. Ich bin November 42 Heiligabend. Wir sollten nach Afrika. Wir waren für Afrika bestimmt. Alles kurze Hosen, Panzer, Sand gestrahlt. Und kurz vorsehen, dass wir weg sollten. Alles abgeben. Winterklamotten anpassen, Panzer alle weiß streichen, da wussten wir, wo es hinging, nach Stalingrad. Right. So he went to, um, so he went to Russia, and uh, that's a very famous part of the World War II. So Knopf was in Russia with three other men on a Panzer tank. 
uh, they waited outside the fortification for the Russians to come out and fight them, but the Russians did not come. Instead came the snow, piling up high all around them. The temperature dropped to minus 56 degrees Celsius. The panzer could not be moved, so the four soldiers decided to abandon the panzer and make their way back to their country, some 3,000 kilometers away. Before abandoning it, they had to destroy the ammunition. They walked thousands of kilometers, and upon arrival in Germany, he was allowed a month's leave, and he went home, met a lovely young woman, fell in love, and got married. Then he went back to the war and survived. In May 1945, when the German army surrendered to the Allied forces, he was in Danzig, which is now in Poland. He was in a group of 400 German soldiers who were brought to the German city of Kiel by the British army. He remembers polishing his belt and shoes before landing and marching through the city Kiel, which had been bombed and was still burning. He remembers the extreme heat from the fires and how people ran out of their houses to offer water to the soldiers. Released after some years, he could not return to Schlesien from where he was, which was no more part of Germany. He was lucky to find his parents and wife at, in Rheinhausen in his grandparents' house. Finally, the soldiers' march came to a halt. Part-time agricultural work or construction repair work was handed out by the authorities and paid with some very salty biscuits that caused a lot of thirst. Ernst Knauf, at 92, can still feel that thirst and narrated the story until this point with extreme passion. His face was red and his 92 years old voice was quivering. Next part of the story, he narrates without passion. A few years later, he had a grocery shop in the village, a job in a factory, and worked from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Over the next decades, his family grew in numbers and financial prosperity. He also became an active member of the choir association of the village as he had a wonderful tenor voice. After listening to him for two hours, I asked him one question. The question was that after having seen all this, what is the most important thing in life? Listen to his answer in his own words. Was ist das Wichtigste im Leben? Friede, Zufriedenheit. Kein Krieg als solches. Wir haben ja Glück gehabt. Früher die Älteren mussten alle zweimal mindestens in den Krieg. Und wir haben es Gott sei Dank nur einmal gebraucht. Der hat wohl auch gereicht für alle die Verluste, da sind sie ja alle wohl ein bisschen vernünftig geworden. Ja, so that was his answer, peace and contentment. The third story, of the makers and keepers of a forest theater, of Brinker Forest Theater, is a story of many people narrated by two 76 to 78 years old men. This is a very big story that will be narrated in a few words. There is a village called Brinker, a very quiet village. Until 1990, it used to be on the border with East Germany. The village Brinker has a Waldbühne, a forest theater, on top of a small hill. You have to walk up a, sta walk up a staircase and on the first landing, before the theater well, there is a plaque dedicated to Brother Grimm. And on top of the plaque, as you can see, and you'll see it in a close-up, is a stone wall, which as far I mark once upon a time. A few, more, um, a few more steps of the staircase, and you reach the open-air theater, a well with a semicircular seating capacity of 900, and a stage set in the deep park. It is beautiful. Let's hear what this is about. 1949 wurde die Waldbühne bis 1947 angefangen zu bauen durch die Flüchtlinge, die hier rüber kamen. Und zu der Zeit gab es ja noch kein Fernsehen und keine Kommunikation, wie wir es heute haben. Und dann haben die sich zusammengeschlossen und gesagt, wir wollen hier was auf die Beine bringen. 
Und dann habe ich das hier angefangen zu bauen. Und wenn man sich das an die Anlage ansieht, das war ja alles Felsen. Das, was hier vorsteht, war alles ein schräger äh, Berg. Und das hat man abgetragen mit äh, Handarbeit. Und das war schon eine gewaltige Leistung, was sie damals geleistet haben. Eben alles mit Handarbeit, auch den Felsen ab, abzusprengen und mit Pickhacke und äh, Hammer und Meisel das wegzubringen, das war schon enorm. Nicht? Und so ist das entstanden. Und wir sind froh, dass wir die Bühne haben. Die ist jetzt über die Grenzen Niedersachsens hinaus bekannt. Und Zuschauerzahlen sprechen dafür. Und Kinder kommen mit freudigen Gläsen, mit tränenden Augen, wenn sie ja weggehen, was sie erlebt haben. Zuerst bis 1964 haben das die Bremker gemacht. Und von 1964 bis 2012 hat das Göttinger Volkstheater hier gespielt. Und seit 2013 spielen wir wieder vom Ring aus. Und die, die Schauspieler, wir haben fast 50 Schauspieler, die wir hier verpflichten können. Ehrenamtlich wohlgemerkt, nicht, nicht auf Honorarbasis, sondern Ehrenamtliche. Und äh, auf, äh, doch, ich glaube schon, das ist eine Zukunft hier für die nächsten 60 Jahre. The next step was. After that, yeah. Bin ich über zwei Jahren bin ich hier als Flüchtling auch hierher gekommen. Und wann war das? 1947. Und aus wo, äh, woher? Aus Schlesien. Schlesien. Ja. Aha. Okay. Meine Eltern gekommen, ja. Der Junge, seit wann wohnen Sie hier in Brinkel? Ich bin 1949 geboren und wohne seit 1949 hier in Brinkel. Ach so. <lacht> es gibt nur verschiedene Dinge. So, Brinkel is a forest theater made by refugees after World War II, as we heard and what we could not hear, because I'm just showing you edited clips. And the theater was made for one single purpose to perform Grimm's Mirachen fairy tales and is kept up by volunteers. So that's why that uh, dedication to brothers Grimm and Esra Einmal as the classic beginning of the folk tale. The fourth narrative, uh, The Woman Who Made a Commune, is a story from another time and generation. Let's see. Mit Freunden zusammen, so acht Leute waren wir zusammen zum Studieren hierher gekommen. In Göttingen. Nach, nach genau, Göttingen. Und dann äh, wollten wir aber auf dem Land wohnen. Also, wir wollten, wir haben nicht in der Stadt, also ich habe in Göttingen studiert, Aha. wir wollten aber unbedingt auf dem Land irgendwas finden. Also, Aha. damals gab es so ein schönes Buch, das hieß Leben auf dem Lande. Ne? Aha. Ne, da, also, alles drin, was ja. man braucht: Garten und Piepenpapen. Und gut, damals hatte ich auch schon ein Kind hm. und habe auch gedacht, also irgendwie ist das Land dann auch schöner, als wenn man jetzt in der Stadt eine Wohnung hat. Hm. Und dann sind wir halt 81 mit acht Leuten und haben hier in Rheinhausen die erste Wohngemeinschaft gegründet. Wobei so viel Landwirtschaft war hier auch nicht mehr. Also das war eigentlich ähm, oben auf der Domäne, die haben noch Landwirtschaft betrieben, hatten damals auch noch viel mehr Rinder. Ähm, aber so viel Landwirtschaft eigentlich nicht mehr. Das war wirklich Herr Zielke und dann auch Herr So, um, this generation, post-1970s, they came with certain ideals. And these ideals, with which Ben Stem and her friends moved to the village were at one level in opposition to the mainstream patterns of capitalist consumerist life. Living in the village was in reality more than just the choice for space. The majority population at that time consisted of the pre-war and post-war generation, people like Silke, and the soldiers were still in their prime. They were not necessarily very convinced of the ideals of the younger generation. Ursula remembers that people would peep into the house to see how this group was living. She herself was a mother of an infant, but was not married to any one of the young men in her group. She realized that the village folk were wondering about the relationships of individuals to each other in her group. However, they did not face any opposition and could go on with their university life in the city and commune in the village. She is the only one of her group who became a permanent resident of Rheinhausen. Her presence has made a difference to the village. She was vocal about having the local schools hours for children extended 
as that allowed women to undertake employment and follow their career path. Currently, she is an active member of the village council. So these are the four narratives for today. Since the narrators and narratives discussed in this paper concern historical references, let us briefly notice some missing parts. No narrative can be properly understood without noticing its silent spaces. When narrators tell of their lives, they are conscious of positioning themselves in definite ways within the larger historical context. This move involves not only articulation of facts, but also silences over certain facts. Silence over a matter can be individuals lapsed, but when several individuals maintain silence over the same facts, then we have to look uh, for reasons outside the narrator's mind. For example, none of the narrators discussed here ever refer to the Holocaust. Even though the village drinker had 60 Jews before 1938 and a synagogue that was burned down. In other villages too, none of the elderly narr narrators who remember the pre-World War II world ever spoke of the Holocaust. When I directly asked Silke, the last farmer, he abused Hitler for destroying the work of this mark. The ex-soldier blamed no one for the war he suffered. It is open to interpretation as to what this silence may imply. It was in 1945 that the World War II end finally ended. The war Germany had started and lost. At that point, Germany was not only a defeated nation, but culturally a demoralized nation, not only because of its role in the war, but because of the Holocaust. That's why the immediate post-war generation um, period of that's why the immediate post-war period of German history has been called Stundenul, zero hour. The generation which had survived the Nazi times is known to have gone silent. Two out of the four narrators, the last farmer and the soldier, belonged to the generation that went silent. As such, it was no small matter, matter that they were narrating their life to me, a stranger they hardly understood. On the other hand, their silence over the Holocaust might say something about the Germans and their inability to deal with this period of their history. One may say then that Holocaust has not yet been narratively processed. It may also say that even after 70 years, Germans cannot reg express regret over the Holocaust. I have situated my documentation of the stories in the contemporary German villages within narrative studies. My analysis today refers to the questions whether folk narrative plays a role in the narration of personal lives, how people remember the post-war moment, and where do they see the change. These are narratives of time and space, narrated as individual life stories, but they also have a relationship with older folk narrative. To create a narrative representation of one's life, the tools of storytelling are those that were unconsciously acquired. This unconscious acquisition happens through multiple sources of folk narratives. The structural elements and values of the folk narrative are so prevalent in the individual stories. The once upon a time and happily ever after are the references with which individuals narrate their own life. In the folk narrative, once upon a time is an indefinite time. The storyteller takes you there to suspend this belief. And happily ever after is never elaborated upon in the folk tale. That is where the story ends. Now let's see if these elements function, how these elements function in the current storytelling. The story of Sikhi's life has three phases. One life of his parental family, none of whom remained in his life after the war. Two, his coming to Rheinhausen, and three, his life in Rheinhausen. His once upon a time over which he cries is with no realistic connection except memory. Then his life is like that of a folktale hero. A young man finds his way to the house of a pretty girl. The girl's family presents him with challenging tasks. He fulfills the task, wins the kingdom, and becomes a king. The folktale, however, does not tell us what happens in the happily ever after, but Silke does. The story of how he was a hard-working man 
who will his life. Even this part is kind of over because his life, wife has died. And when Silke stands to look back from his happy state, he cries. The last farmer of Silke's tears were telling a story he would never give words to. The story of unbearable pain and loss he has experienced as a human being. The ex-soldier at 92 did not once mention the leader or the ideology that sent him to war. What he wanted to tell a listener who had come from thousands of kilometers away was his life as soldier from 1942 to the end of 1940s, beginning of 1950s. The structure of his story matches most perfectly with the structure of the folk narrative tale. An ordinary young man living a normal life is snatched away from it and made to face huge, huge challenges. He learns a lot, especially about his own capabilities, faces hardship and defeat, but finally emerges out of it and lives happily ever after. Like the folk tale, the ex-soldier does not delve into the details of happily ever after because it is banal in comparison with the adventure and drama of the active time. But he has drawn wise lessons from his life. The story of the Bremke Waldbühne, Forest Seeker, actually does not even start in 1947 when they say it does, but it starts in 1812 with the publication of Jakob and Wilhelm Grimm's collection of German folk tales or Märchen called Kinder and House Nation, Children and Household Fairy Tales. It has been well established by research that this book became evidence for the cultural similarity of the German speaking people across political boundaries before Germany became a nation. Brother Grimms had theorized on the idea of the Kultur Nation, the cultural nation, and supported the movement for a unified Germany. The phenomenal success of this work has meant that it has become part of cultural memory. In 1947, Brinker faced the post-war devastation and the arrival of German refugees from eastern regions. When the refugees and the na natives decided to make the world Buner to perform Grimm's Märchen with and for children, they were being they were doing something more than what was visible. Grimm's Märchen were the shared cultural good, cultural item, and the making of the Wallbühne brought together the older residents and the new refugees. It bonded them over and above their regional differences. It allowed them to create an institution of cultural memory for themselves and for their progeny. In a way, the Grimm's fairy tales were created for this role to construct the cultural identity of German-speaking people then, in 19th century, across political boundaries. By making the world unit, the refugees re-nativized themselves and revitalized the village. The entire village is the hero in the making of the world unit. People say that in the first decade of the world unit, there used to be a hundred people on stage. No one was refused a role. And that's what suggests that they were doing more than performing a play. One could say that by colliding collective experiences with the Grimm's Märchen, they bonded and healed themselves and could participate in the making of New Germany. In difference to all the other narrators, the people who have chosen to move to live in the villages since 1970s express a modern disjunction. They do not identify with the pre-war village. They have not come for agriculture or religion, the two binding factors of the pre-war and post-war village life. They have come because they see the village as a place where community life is possible, where experiments in forms of living can be realized, and where one can make a difference. Ironically, they are actually looking for the pre-war, pre-industrial village. They see themselves as people who do not wish to live in industrial anonymity. Even currently, people move uh, to villages for alternative ways of life. My reading of the situation suggests that community has not disappeared from the villages, but a new kind of community has arisen. This community is based on new principles, which are voluntary membership of the community, 
freedom to choose the level of engagement, and yes, commitment to community life. This community is not defined by bonding produced by agriculture or religion, but by individual choice. And yet, it utilizes old structures of making perina associations. There is an association in the village for everything, for maintaining the forest theater, for looking after the church, for repairing monuments, for finding village history, for music, for everything. This system comes from pre-war villages. Very old patterns underlie new expressions. Village is a cultural palimpsest, and cultural palimpsest lets one see only the top layer until it is held against the light, and the light is provided here by micro-narratives of time and space. These four narratives of time and space in German villages show that the temporality of culture exists on a tension line between stasis and change. Culture appears static in its present moment and the change is invisible. Narrative reflection on the past lets the temporality of culture be articulated and spatially located. Narratives connect the past with the present and the future of culture. And the static moment of the present starts to move backwards and forwards through narration and narrative. Thank you for listening.